Hey, welcome back friends. It's me, R. Dallas from Nimble Pros. In the last few videos, we've been exploring guard clauses and validation as ways to ensure that our domain model stays in a valid, consistent state. But manually performing validation is tedious and error prone. So in this video, we're gonna take a look at how to bake that into our process. We're gonna be using CQRS, Mediator, Fluent Validation, and the Chain of Responsibility pattern. Let's get started. All right, so I've created a new clean architecture application using my clean architecture template, and it's got the basic contributor record stuff in it. If you haven't seen it, it's real simple. It's just an entity with an ID and a name, and there's some CRUD endpoints you can use to manipulate it. So if I go ahead and start this application, and then I try to create a new contributor, and we'll give them just a name of J, I'm gonna send this request and you see we get a bad request saying the name length must be at least two characters. This is using Fluent Validation. Now, where this is happening is inside of Visual Studio, you can see this is the create endpoint. This is using fast endpoints uh, to do the work. And there's a request. That request just has a required name variable. And then there's a validator. And this is using Fluent Validation. And it's just validating that the name is not empty, and it has a minimum length of two, which is the rule that we've violated here. Okay, now, what if we don't just wanna do that inside of our web API layer? What if instead we wanna make sure that this happens closer to our domain model, somewhere either in the domain model itself or in the use cases layer that surrounds it? All right, and so in this example architecture, there is a use cases project and it's following CQRS, Command Query Responsibility Segregation. And so for contributors, it has various commands for create, delete, etc. And it also has queries for uh, doing a get or doing a list. And you can imagine there might be other queries. All right. So looking at this create contributor command, you can see that it just takes in a string name. And that's going to try and then be used by the handler to create the contributor. So if we look at the handler... The handler just takes that name that we pass into the command and tries to create a contributor and then save it using a repository and then it returns back the created item. Now, nowhere in here are we doing any of that validation. If we look at the contributor itself, that's part of our domain model, it's gonna be inside this contributor aggregate folder and a contributor is a really simple entity here. It has a name property uh, and inside of this, we're using a primary constructor. And when that primary constructor gets assigned during initialization, it's going to guard against that being null or empty, but it's not going to do anything else, right? It's not going to check, for instance, that the name has a minimum length of two. Now, we could add that. That's something that we could put in the, into the entity itself if we wanted to. Uh, but it's also something that we could check earlier than that using validation. And, and we probably should because these guard clauses are gonna throw exceptions. And like we saw in the last video, validation is a much nicer, more user-friendly way to check that user input is passed in what we expect. All right, so let's see how we can add it inside of Mediator. All right, so I've created a command validator here. And you can see this looks an awful lot like the request validator that we have at the API level, but this is now disassociated from anything to do with ASP.NET Core or fast endpoints or anything with web, right? So this would work in a CLI, this would work in a WinForms or WPF app, it would work anywhere because it's part of our domain model. It's just code at this point, not coupled to any particular UI. And so in here, uh, we're checking exactly the same things. We're saying name is required, but how do I wire this up? Well, inside the handler, I could come in here and before I do this work, I could do a check to see whether or not that's valid. But I'd have to do that in every one of these handlers, right? Later on, we're gonna do a delete handler and maybe the delete handler, which, which is just this line right here, maybe this wants to validate that the ID that we're deleting, which is uh, this contributor ID, you know, make sure that that's not zero or less, right? Make sure it's positive. Uh, I'd have to do some validation to check that right here. Again, we want to avoid adding additional duplicate logic inside all these handlers. We want to have a policy that automatically does this work for us. And the chain of responsibility pattern gives us that ability to do that. It's exactly what the ASP.NET Core middleware does, which is to have some type of a command 
that gets passed on and passed on from one handler to another until ultimately a handler you know does the the terminating handling of the request and then it comes back out of the uh, the process right and so this delete handler or or this create handler this handler right here is the terminating process you can see because it's returning an id it does not call next it does not call into another uh, handler so because I'm using mediator here, there's something called a behavior that's built into mediator and a pipeline behavior, we'll just put it right here so you can see it, is the interface that you want to implement. And with a pipeline behavior, you, you get the benefit of this chain of responsibility pattern where each request is actually going to go through a series of these different handlers, these different behaviors before it gets to the, the ultimate terminating handler. In here, you see this looks just like any other handler. It has a handle method that takes in a request, but it also takes in a, another delegate, right? This is the next thing in the chain. And that's basically how the chain of responsibility pattern works. It's exactly how middleware works. Uh, and so in here, we're going to check to see if there's any validators for this particular thing that we're, we're working on. In this case, these are validators of T requests. That's gonna be the command that we're working with. And if there are, we're going to create a context and check for the results of those validators. And then if there are failures, we're going to throw a validation exception. All right. So all of this logic here is just to run one or more validators for that command. But, and then we'll call next, but we're only going to get to call next if we don't throw this exception. Okay. To verify that this works, we can write a unit test for this. And so these are going to actually be integration tests because they're going to rely on mediator being set up properly and DI working properly. Uh, you could write unit tests for it as well, but then you'd have to mock out some things and it's nicer if we don't have to do that. So in here, I've got a create contributor handler integration test, and it says that it will throw a validation exception given an invalid name. And we're going to wire up a bunch of stuff here. We're going to set up the validators here. So this is where that create contributor command validator is being added to our services. That's so we can inject it in. We're gonna register our validation behavior. That's so that the behavior will, will kick in when mediator tries to, to call into the handler. And then we're gonna actually resolve mediator here and then use it to send this command, right? So right here at the bottom, we're, we're gonna send the command and we're expecting that it's gonna throw a validation exception. And if we run this, uh, right here, you can see it's it's already passing. And we're going to run it with a null command, like a null name, an empty name, a name that's one letter, and a name that's 101 letters. And in all those cases, you can see that this passes. Uh, we can do the same thing with the delete contributor command and check that, you know, when we have a, a zero or a negative one, we have all the same setup. And, and we'll pull that out into a shared fixture. But you, you call this and, and it does the exact same thing. You can see that test passes as well. Here's what that validator looks like. We just say, hey, the, uh, the rule for the contributor ID on that command is that it be greater than zero. With this approach, you can see that now I have great separation of concerns, right? Everything has to do with the command. It's just the data that is needed. Everything that has to do with handling the command is just right here. And then the validator itself is, is only responsible for validation, right? And then actually performing the validation is now a policy that just exists inside of our pipeline. Now in our real code, we're wiring that up inside this autofac module. So right here, I've got a register mediator method and it's setting up mediator. It's setting up another behavior called logging behavior that logs things before and after each call. Then it performs the validation. I'm also using mediator for my domain events, which we'll talk about more in another video. And it's wiring up all of the mediator types. All right, so just to see this in action in the actual web application, if we look at the delete endpoint, you're gonna see that there is a request for this and a validator that says it has to be greater than zero. We're gonna go ahead and just remove this validator. And what that means is that it's gonna use the validator that's in our use cases layer. All right, so we're just gonna test that our delete validator works now. We're gonna send it a negative one. And if we send this request, we get a 500 internal server error we can see that it's a validation exception, says validation failed, contributor ID must be greater than zero. Obviously this is not the cleanest result that we would like to get. We'd much rather this return of, of an actual 400 telling us that there was a, a bad request, but we'll work on that in the next video where we're gonna show how to use the result type with your mediator pipeline 
to make it so that you can have better ways to return back results from the pipeline when things don't go the way you'd expect. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this useful. Look forward to the next video where we're going to show how to take this exact same thing and take it one step further so we get cleaner results coming back to our API. If you want to get notified of that, please make sure to subscribe, hit the bell if you want to get a notification, and keep improving.